Hello, good afternoon. Today we are talking about emerging viruses. Probably you've all heard this term, but in case you haven't, it is the causative agent of a new or previously unrecognized infection. Right, so that's important. Sometimes it's a new virus that we haven't seen before, but sometimes it's one we've seen that all of a sudden is doing different things for some reason. And this term was popularized in the 1990s. So when I started working in the field, no one said emerging virus, but it was coined back then. But emerging viruses are not new. Viruses have been emerging since the advent of uh, agriculture, I would say, which allowed people to begin to congregate in cities in bigger and bigger numbers. Before that, it was not sustainable. And we started to get infections transmitted amongst us because previously we were in small communities, harder to transmit. I'm sure emerging viruses were going on before that. You know, ancient hominids and their ancestors as well. But it probably started on a larger scale about when we started congregating. And you know, part of the reason we only see them now is we got we started to get very good at it. I would say that the first emerging virus infection was in the late 60s, Lassa virus, where all of a sudden this new infection starts in Africa. We'd never seen it before. That would have been an emerging virus, but it, the term wasn't in use back then. So here are more definitions. There's Lassa virus story, The Hunt for a New Killer Virus. This is a great book. I love it. Emerging viruses are viruses with an expanded host range and an increase in disease that we didn't see before. Zika virus would be one, which we saw in 1947, caused the rash disease, and all of a sudden in 2015, it causes congenital birth defects. That's an emerging infection because it's causing a new kind of disease. Emerging viruses can often result in transmission of viruses from animals to, to humans. That's what we call zoonoses. Transmission from a non-human animal to a human. We'll talk about some of those today. And sometimes these zoonoses, which are also called cross-species infections, sometimes they establish a new virus in the population. And HIV used to be SIV, simian immunodeficiency virus of chimps and old world monkeys. It jumped into humans around 1920 and it became a human virus. Now it is transmitted within humans and it's called human immunodeficiency virus. Sometimes these zoonoses cannot be sustained in humans. Ebola virus is a great example, which we'll talk about today, and it's relative Marburg virus as well. Here are some numbers on how many of emerging viruses we're aware of. This pie chart shows you viruses be, be longing to a number of genera. So these are genera. The blue uh, are what we call adapted pathogens. These are viruses that we got from animals as homo sapiens, and they've become adapted to us. They are now our viruses like measles, which we got from cows, and smallpox, which we got from camels, etc. They're now human viruses. We're about 32 genera of those. And then in 37 are zoonotic pathogens that have limited human transmission. And Ebola virus is one of those. Once it gets into people, it's not easy for it to transmit. And every new outbreak of Ebola is a brand new spillover from an animal reservoir. That's an indication that this virus can't establish itself in humans. The heirloom pathogens in orange, 16, are from uh, species older than Homo sapiens, all right, like Australopithecus, you know, all those uh, older ones that are not Homo something. And those we got vertically transmitted from our ancestors, so they just maintained along the chain of evolution. And then we have heirloom path pathogens that came from related Homo species, like Homo neanderthalensis. That's the only one I'm going to try, but there are others as well. So that's what we think are circulating in us right now. What are the factors that regulate whether viruses come from different sources into us? Here are some of them, and they're all relatively new, like air travel, big cities and expanded populations, poverty, 
poor conditions that allow viruses to circulate, deforestation, microbial evolution, of course, which has always been happening, environmental changes. See these tires, they're full of mosquitoes, most likely. And climate change, of course. Temperatures ra rise, mosquito range expands. It's very clear that mosquito ranges are changing, and for diseases, they're changing as well. The, the malaria range is expanding as the mosquito range expands as well. There's no doubting it. You know, for, for all those doubters of climate change out there, if you look at infectious disease, it's quite clear, and I showed you some uh, images of that in terms of mosquito range earlier. But a huge factor, of course, is population explosion of the Earth, of humans, which at one point, you know, we were isolated uh, colonies of 20 or 30 people, and very hard for infectious diseases to spread amongst them, but huge explosion of population. Look at that graph, it's just amazing. That's billions on the y-axis. And so this growth not only puts us in contact with more people, but we change the world. We change the ecosystems, and we provide opportunities for encountering more viruses. Here's a, an example. This is the Amazon north region of Brazil, sites where viruses were isolated. All these boxes that you can't read are names of viruses. Look at them all that we know of that exist in the Amazon. And so what are we doing? We're, do, we're cutting down all the trees here. So people go in and they cut the trees down. They're exposed to these mosquitoes and they may be infected. And then whatever it is that they're gonna do with the land, uh, we're moving around the, the native wildlife on which these viruses are living and reproducing and they may go somewhere else. So this kind of incursion of humans can lead to encounters with uh, new viruses. And a number of new viruses have in fact infected people from these regions. Here are some of the emerging viruses that we recognize, and we've talked about some of them, like dengue virus. And on the right are the drivers of the emergence of that virus. We're gonna talk about a few of these today. We'll talk about Ebola viruses, Hantam viruses, Hendra. We'll have a lecture next week on HIV. Uh, we have talked already about influenza virus. We're not gonna deal with that today. SARS coronavirus, Nipah, and MERS coronavirus, we will talk about, and C. nombre. But these are all emerged in some way, either a new virus that we hadn't seen before, or a virus that we had known for a while, like Zika. All of a sudden, its disease pattern changed. And of course, evolution of viral genomes has a big role to play in emerging viruses, because this gives you biodiversity. It, it provides the quasi-species diversity that allows viruses to adapt to new hosts and environments. And that, of course, without a quasi-species, this couldn't happen. So viruses are in one species, like a bat, harbor many different viruses, as you'll see today. And when we encounter them, or when other animals encounter them, who then encounter us, the quasi-species is passed on, and maybe one genome that's particularly adapted to replicating in us will predominate. There are four different ways that hosts and viruses can interact, and they're shown on this picture that I want to spend a few moments talking about. We have what we call stable host virus interactions, and these are interactions that maintain viruses in the ecosystem. Then we have evolving interactions, and that's when a virus goes to a naive population, it can be the same host, so it can be a population of humans that's never seen the virus before, or it could be from an animal to a human. So a virus goes into a new population, it, it evolves rapidly until it comes to some equilibrium. It might become a stable relationship at some point. Uh, then we have dead end interactions. That's one way passage to a different species. And I'll show you a couple examples of that today. So it's not transmitted from that dead end species to another very effectively. And then we have resistant hosts where Infection is blocked for some reason at some level of the reproductive cycle and nothing happens. The virus doesn't cause disease, it doesn't spread to another person. And these are connected, so stable uh, host virus relationships provide viruses that can become evolving interactions or dead end and those, what, those are what we call emerging infections. When it goes from a stable relationship, say in a zoonotic species, into humans. So it can go from a stable to an evolving, stable to a dead end as well. So the red is the major pathways 
a virus moving among these different interactions. And the, the black arrows show you that these other transitions can occur, but they're, they're more rare. So let's look at this in a little more detail. Let's take the stable host virus interaction. So here we have hosts and viruses. The hosts are surviving and the virus multiplies in the host without wiping it out and can spread to other hosts to amplify itself. And some of these are permanent. We, we acquire a stable virus host relationship. Sometimes it becomes permanent. It becomes a human virus as I implied earlier. And we're the only natural host for measles virus at the moment, even though it came from a cow, from rinderpest virus, it is now adapted to humans. It's a human virus that doesn't infect any other animals. Herpes simplex viruses, cytomegaloviruses, smallpox virus, these all originated in animals. They are now human viruses. And sometimes this stable relationship includes more than one host species. It doesn't have to be one like influenza A viruses, multiple animal species, including humans, flaviviruses, and togaviruses. And we'll see examples of this today. Uh, evolving host virus relationships. Again, these are when virus uh, comes typically from a stable interaction. The virus goes into a new host that it hasn't entered before, and it may replicate and begin to transmit. But initially, there's a lot of instability, which means that the virus is changing rapidly. So instability and unpredictability, you don't know where this is heading. And these outcomes of these evolving infections can range from benign, no effect on the host, to death. A great example, introduction of smallpox and measles viruses to American natives by old world colonists and slave traders. They came across the Atlantic, brought their viruses with them, which had emerged. Smallpox and measles emerged in the Middle East didn't emerge in the Americas, so the traders brought them over. The people in the Americas were completely naive, and these viruses wiped them out. And of course, introduction of myxoma virus to eliminate rabbits, similar situation. Those rabbits had never seen myxoma virus, and when that first year when we put them in, 99 point something percent lethal. In the dead end interaction, we go from a stable to a dead end, or you can go from a evolving to a dead end. But most of the time you're going from a stable interaction, the virus goes into a, a host that is not a proper host for it. It's a dead end reaction. There's no sustained transmission from the inf new infected host to others of the same species. And so Ebola virus is a good example of this. In humans, chimps, and gorillas, we are not the natural host of Ebola viruses. We are dead end hosts. The actual host is probably a bat or bats. We're not absolutely sure of that yet, but humans are dead ends. Now you may say, oh, but Ebola transmits, doesn't it? Yes, but it never sustains. Biggest outbreak, 25,000 in 2015, was unprecedented of Ebola virus. And lots of factors contributed to the spread and often caring for patients contributes to the spread because if you're not taught how to contain an infection and you're caring for someone, you will spread the infection. But for the most part, the outbreaks are smaller, a few hundred or a thousand or so. They fizzle out eventually. And then the next one is a brand new spillover. So dead end may be confusing to you because it is transmitted, but it's never sustained and every outbreak is a new spillover from a zoonotic host. H5N1 in avian influenza virus is another example of a dead end in humans. This is a bird virus. It can be pathogenic, highly pathogenic in birds and occasionally it infects people and it can be lethal, but it rarely transmits from person to person. It's a dead end in people. And so these dead ends really mean nothing to the virus because it is spreading very effectively other ways. The dead end contributes nothing to the natural infection and they're accidents that happen because there's so many people on the planet. We're likely to encounter an infected animal at one time or another. Even if you stay here in New York your whole life, you may encounter an infected raccoon in Central Park. There are rabid raccoons in Manhattan, and that would be a zoonotic infection. That's a dead end. Rabies, natural hosts are wild animals. We're not, we're a dead end infection. We don't spread it to each other. Let's look at a couple of these interactions so you get a sense, and a broader sense of what I'm talking about. So here is an arbovirus. Arbovirus is a term 
it's not a taxonomic term. It means arthropod-borne virus. It can be mosquitoes or ticks. And it, the viruses that are arboviruses cross different families. So here we have a stable host virus cycle with an arbovirus where it cycles among wild birds via mosquitoes. And it can be pretty complicated. You can have multiple species of wild birds and multiple species of mosquitoes. But this is a stable host virus interaction. It's spread from bird to bird. That's the reservoir of the virus, and it's a stable host virus interaction. Chickens can even be involved in this as well. The dead end hosts are humans and horses. They can be bitten by mosquitoes, of course. We encounter them all the time. And they, they give us virus when they take a blood meal, and we may be infected, and it can be lethal, but we do not spread the infection. Even if a mosquito bit us while we were, say, viremic, it wouldn't spread it because probably the viremia is not high enough. It hasn't well adapted to us. It's well adapted to its natural host, the bird. So these are dead ends. And that's an example of a virus going from a stable host virus interaction into a dead end interaction. Here's another example where ticks are involved. It's the same kind of stable host virus interaction. Here we have ticks moving viruses among rodents. So the rodent is the reservoir. Ticks, of course, take blood meals and they spread it to other rodents. And uh, they may also bite goats and spread the virus to them, but if they bite uh, humans, or if humans drink goat milk from an infected goat, they will get the infection. They're dead ends. The humans do not serve as transmission vectors for this virus. So two examples of, of viruses going from a stable host virus relationship into a dead end host. Now here are some examples of flaviviruses that have reservoirs and different insect vectors. And here we're looking at the host, the, the reservoir host essentially, and the vector, different mosquitoes or tick. And here are the flaviviruses, some of which we have talked about today in this course. West Nile virus is up there. That is in a group of viruses spread by a certain kind of mosquito, culicine mosquitoes, and its reservoir is birds. So the virus in birds is the stable host virus relationship. People are a dead end for West Nile virus infection. Then we have the dengue viruses, Zika and, and yellow fever. They're all spread by the Aedes mosquito. And the, the reservoir can be primates. Uh, for some, some of these, we don't always identify the reservoir. But for dengue, for example, we suspect that in some outbreaks there are primate reservoirs. But for dengue, most of the time, it does go from person to person. So that's established itself as a human virus. Same thing for Zika and yellow fever. And then we have here a tick-borne encephalitis virus that is spread uh, by ticks biting rodents. So in order for a, an emerging infection to take hold and have a chance of getting anywhere, it has to be introduced into a new species. It has to become established. And it has to disseminate. It's not easy to do. And here are two examples of viruses coming from rodents or camels to infect people. We'll look at uh, these specific examples today. We have lots of ways to encounter viruses. So the introduction part of this slide, we have made this a lot easier over the last 100 years by all our technology, like dams and irrigation, deforestation. Uh, we, we interfere with wildlife in all ways. We long distance transport livestock and spread infections, air travel. Daycare is a big one. We never used to, when I grew up, there was no daycare. And now we put kids in large groups together and they infect each other and, and all the people who are taking care of them. So it's a wonderful way to spread diseases. Hot tubs that aren't properly sanitized, air conditioning that's not properly taken care of, the used tires, as I said. And then, of course, blood transfusion. We started to do not very long ago and we recognized very quickly that we can spread infections. And so every time we discover a new pathogen in the blood supply, we have to check for it. And who knows if one will emerge again. You know, HIV was spread big time in the blood supply before we knew it was there. And so many other ways that we've encountered viruses. OK, we have plenty of ways to encounter viruses, but most of the time, nothing happens. 
we, we all encounter viruses on a daily basis. They may enter us and replicate it somewhat. They may not replicate at all, but we just don't know anything is happening. And even if you are infected, let's say a single human encounters a virus from an animal, it may replicate in that human. It may, that human may not transmit the virus to someone else, it may not make enough viremia or enough aerosol, et cetera. So it may be confined to one person. And we'll see uh, next time how you know, the transmission of SIV to humans was uh, an event that had a lot of things associated with it, with, which allowed it to work and transmit to humans. But it probably happened many, many times, and we never detected it, either chimps to humans or other viruses coming from other a animals into humans. So the point is that these spillovers from animals, these zoonoses, they probably happen all the time, but we never know about them because they never go anywhere. Once a virus has entered a new host, it has to, of course, find susceptible and permissive tissues. And so it may find those in a host, but then it, that host has to be able to transmit the virus. So if it's someone living in the forest with no one else around, it's not going to go anywhere. And we'll see how that was overcome next time when AIDS arose uh, in the early 1920s. Of course, the health of the individual is important. May he or she may be able to eliminate the virus or maybe not. Only when virus goes from one person to another, from that initially infected person to others, to create serial infections or a chain of transmission, only then will the virus continue. But as we'll see today, sometimes the virus is poorly transmissible. Not every virus is like measles virus with a R naught of 20. Many are lesser, and we'll see an example today of an emerging virus infection that petered out because it was poorly infectious. So here are some real-world examples of introduction of viruses into new environments. And of course, the diseases of exploration and colonization are always used as examples of what happens when a virus enters a naive population. Remember, last time we talked about how smallpox originated uh, in the Far East, uh, probably from camels, and it reached Europe because it's connected and it's easy for people to get from the Far East to Europe, and it became epidemic in Europe. And then as people began to cross the ocean in boats, the infected individuals brought it to, them, to the New World with them and changed the balance of human populations here. Uh, smallpox alone killed 3.5 million Aztecs in two years. It was spread from uh, Hispaniola, and that allowed Cortez to conquest uh, these peoples. Not because he was a particularly good soldier or had a lot of soldiers with him, but the infections had already wiped out most uh, of the population. So again, this population in the New World had never seen the virus. Had, they had not evolved and adapted to it. It had not slowly spread through the population, uh, leaving immunity here and there as it did in Europe. And it was introduced in a big way and it wiped out a lot of people. So that's what can happen when a new virus is introduced into a new naive population. But again, remember, this is already at a human adapted virus. And an emerging virus is typically coming from an animal. It's not well adapted to humans, so it doesn't cause explosive infections as, as this did. Here's, here's one of my favorite examples. Uh, this is a virus epidemic that emerged because of changes in human populations and environment. Poliomyelitis was virtually unknown until the beginning of the 20th century. There's a case here and there. You can look in the recorded medical history and see descriptions of what clearly is poliomyelitis, but not until the beginning of the 20th century were there actually epidemics of polio. We've known it for 4,000 years. I showed you the Egyptian priest and that priest most likely had polio, but only in the 20th century. Oh, here is the Egyptian priest with the paralyzed leg that looks like uh, it is polio. It's been around, but it didn't attain epidemic form until the 20th century. So it's an emerging infection because its pattern of infection is changing. You have outbreaks now of tens and hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands of individuals. So what happened? Here's the epidemiological curve annual reported cases in the U.S. with year. And you can see very little until early 1900s, then bigger and bigger and bigger 
spikes of disease. And we call polio a disease of modern sanitation. Why? Because around the turn of this 20th century, we developed toilets and sewers. So we no longer had to throw our chamber pot material onto the street in the morning. So before the 20th century and the development of sanitation, polio spread very quickly. When you were born, you got polio right away, but you were protected by your mother's antibodies. So you got an inner parent infection, you developed your own immunity, and that was the end of it. Now we, inc we improve sanitation. You're not infected right away in your first few months of life. You delay infection a few years until you encounter some fecal contamination. By then your mother's antibodies are gone, the virus now replicates in you, and that causes epidemics of polio. It's a disease of modern sanitation. Wasn't mutation. If this happened today, people would blame mutation of the genome on the changing pattern of polio, right? <laughs> but we didn't know anything about genomes in 1900. All we knew was that the pattern changed, and so we figured it out based on antibody transmission from the mother and circulation in the virus and so forth. So I always like to say it's really easy to blame mutation, but you need to look elsewhere. And this is a prime example of elsewhere is really the explanation. Here's a cool picture from the 20s and 30s in New York City. They would stick these on the house if there was a kid found with polio inside. Keep out of this house, as if this would make any difference, right? Because the people not paralyzed are the ones walking around. Let's look at some more recent emerging infections. Turns out that bats have a lot of viruses in them. You know, bats are the most plentiful <laughs> mammal on the planet. You're not. Bats are more plentiful than you are. And uh, they have lots of viruses in them. We don't know why they have so many viruses, and they seem to be OK with them. Uh, we think they, because they have to deal with high oxidative stress, because they fly, they have a lot of gene whose gene products are involved with handling that. And apparently, uh, that can protect them against infection as well. If you look at the genome of bats, they have lots of uh, immune genes duplicated which suggests that you can get higher levels of the gene product that protects them. Anyway, bats are a source of zoonotic infections, and there are two that I want to talk about specifically, Nipah and Hendra viruses, which have been found in flying foxes. This is a flying fox. It's a wingspan of about three or four feet. They have a lot of viruses in them, uh, and uh, they have transmitted it to humans, as you'll see. Uh, here's an article that was published a couple of years ago. Bats host major mammalian paramyxoviruses. So in this study, they took samples from 119 bats and also some rodents and found 66 new paramyxoviruses. So Nipah and Hendra are paramyxoviruses. So there are a lot more out there in bats. As we expand our populations, we have more and more contact with bats. So the likelihood is that we are going to get more viruses from them. So Nipah virus uh, was first noted in an outbreak in Malaysia in 1988. There was an outbreak of uh, respiratory and neurological disease on pig farms. The pigs got sick and they transmitted the infection to their handlers. You know, when you take care of pigs, you get pretty close to them and so they can transmit the infection. There were 105 human deaths, so they killed a million pigs to stop this infection. Very sad, but they had to do it. Not all those million pigs were infected, but it was the only way to stop uh, the infection. And the virus came from fruit bats. They excrete, excrete the virus in their urine and what happens here is that uh, pig farmers they plant mangoes near their pig pens, and the mangoes can be eaten by the pigs and, and the humans as well. And the uh, bats like to eat mangoes as well, so they will come at night and eat the mangoes contaminated with their urine that has virus on it. And then uh, the pigs eat the mangoes, they get infected, they spread the virus to humans by respiratory aerosols. So we, all, we figured that all out. And then subsequently we found in uh, India and Bangladesh that uh, humans were getting infected by consuming date palm sap. And in these countries, they, they collect date palm sap by putting a little a tap into the tree. There's the palm tree and a little bucket. And it turned out that people were getting uh, Nipah virus infections from this sap, which is highly prized. And the way it's collected is they leave this, the thing there overnight, and in the morning they take it and drink it. Well, it turns out that at night bats go because go into these pots because they like the date palm sap and they urinate in it and it gets Nipah virus. So the solution was simply to cover these pots 
you know, a low-tech solution like screens and so forth, and that stops uh, the transmission. By the way, there's a, there's a great exhibit at the Smithsonian now called Outbreak, and this is a, a photo I took of it. Uh, it's got the date palm, this is a palm tree here. Here's an exhibit on Nipah virus, and here's a guy carrying two of these uh, buckets full of date palm sap, and they had a palm tree here, and they explained all of this in this exhibit. So if you ever get to DC, the Smithsonian, they have this very cool exhibit called Outbreak. So that's Nipah. Another paramyxovirus, Handra virus, discovered in Australia in September of 1994. There was an outbreak on a racehorse farm, killed 14 racehorses and a trainer that took care of them. And what happens here is that flying foxes, again, uh, are spreading the virus to horses. So they probably come into the stables at night and they urinate and contaminate the area, and horses get infected, and then they spread from uh, horses to humans. And these, these have continued to occur. Horses continue to acquire infections. In this part of Australia, you see where the red dots are, the, the northeast coast. It's a town called Hendra. Now what they have done is make a vaccine for horses. This is, this is called a one-world health vaccine because everything's intertwined in this planet, so we don't want to immunize all the people against this virus because there aren't enough people at risk. And you could say, well, why don't we immunize just racehorse trainers? What are there, 500 of those in Australia? You're going to make a vaccine for five? No. So you, you immunize the horses because they're all at risk. And that protects the people. So we call that a one world health vaccine. And there are a couple of other examples of that. So on this map, here are the Hendra outbreaks in red and the Nipah outbreaks, India, Bangladesh, Malaysia. And the, the blue line is the range of these flying foxes, these bats that carry these viruses. So it potentially could have infections elsewhere. And I went to Australia uh, in 2014 and I, I interviewed this uh, Lin Fa Wang who uh, works on bats and bat viruses. He's the real Batman. He's not the one, not the other guy and Robin, but he's, he's really into bats and understanding why they can get infected and, and live a long time. And uh, so that was, that's a really fun episode if you want to learn about bats. So th that one I just told you, Nipa and Hendra, the culprit is we put our stuff, meaning pig farms and horse farms, close to the forest where bats live because we're encroaching on their territory. Another determinant of emergence is changing climate and animal populations. And this is hantavirus, which was first found in the Four Corners area of New Mexico in 1993. There you go, Four Corners, four states come together. And the virus is called C. nombre virus. It's a virus endemic in the deer mouse, Paramyscus meliculatus. If you just randomly catch mice, about 30% of them are gonna be virus positive. You shouldn't really catch wild mice because this is pretty dangerous if you inhale this virus. And so in general, you should stay away from them, especially if you're camping, you should be really careful. If there are mouse droppings wherever you're camping, be careful. You don't want to aerosolize them, as I'll show you. So this is a bunya virus, which we haven't talked about much in this course, but they're envelope viruses with segmented RNA genomes. This the virus, by the way, was isolated First case was near Muerto Canyon, it's a place. So they called it, CDC often calls viruses from where they are isolated. But the people who live in Muerto Canyon didn't want a virus named after them. So they went through a couple of name changes. They didn't like any of them, so they ended up calling it Sin Nombre because they couldn't agree on anything. Although, I don't know, Muerto Canyon is pretty bad in itself, right? <laughs> See, I live in Muerto Canyon. Who cares if there's a virus from there? Anyway, so this is a uh, hantavirus. What happened? Why did we see this in 1993? That's the question. So it turns out that in that year, there was a lot of rainfall, and there was a lot of pignon nuts as a result of the big rainfall. And humans like pignon nuts, but so do mice. And so the deer mouse population rose, and they began to invade people's homes, and they would defecate and urinate in the home. And that's where the virus comes out of the mouse feces and urine. And so you would have homes contaminated with urine and feces. And you know, if it dries out and you try and sweep it up, it aerosolizes, you inhale it. So that's one of the ways we think people inhale it. So the mouse is the natural host for this virus. They seem to be okay with it. But when it gets into us, when it spills over into us, we get very sick 
uh, we get a very severe hantavirus pulmonary syndrome, often fatal. It doesn't get transmitted from one person to another. This is a dead end, not well adapted to humans. So every new infection is a brand new spillover uh, from the rodents. And looking back, serologically, we realize this virus has been around since 1959 because people have antibodies to it. We just never noticed it before. So far in the U.S., there have been 728 cases of Hanta pulmonary syndrome, HPS. And you can see some states have more than others. We've had three here in New York. So there are mice that, that harbor this virus in many states. Here is the range of Paramiscus maniculatus on the right. And that's the deer mouse. But the virus can also be found in the white-footed mouse, the rice rat, and the cotton rat. So when you encounter a mouse in the forest, I would say you should ask them which one it is before you interact with it. And that way you can be sure that none of them are harboring this virus. Make sure it's not a deer mouse, a white-footed mouse, a rice rat, and a cotton rat. All right, so CDC keeps track of these. And in fact, these three in New York State were in campers. You know, sometimes when you camp, instead of actually pitching a tent, you go on these platforms, and there's a thing already built on the platform. Mice tend to live under them. And in these cases, there were mice feces that were dried and full of virus, and that's how the people uh, got infected. And also, same thing happened in uh, California in some of the state parks. Again, droppings of mice. Another interesting virus recently emerged, heartland virus disease. It was discovered in 2012. It's a flebovirus, which is also a bunyavirus, uh, like C. nombre, identified in two farmers in Missouri. So these two farmers on separate farms came in with this disease, which included high fever and thrombocytopenia. They couldn't figure out what was wrong with them. But the only thing they had in common is that every day when they came back from the fields, they were covered with ticks. And so they took some of their blood and they sequenced it and they found this virus in it, a brand new virus. And it's since been found in, in 40 other individuals. And it's spread by a tick vector. It's called the Lone Star Tick because it's got a lone star on its back. And we don't know how long this has been infecting people. It's probably been around a long time. But you know, we only recently got the ability to sequence blood, nucleic acids, and discover these viruses. And here, here's the uh, range. These are where the cases have been identified uh, in the US, the heartland of the US, I suppose. Let's look at Ebola hemorrhagic fever now. This began in 1976. There were outbreaks in DRC and Sudan with very high mortality rates, 88% and 53%. When you try and track an infectious disease, you want to find an index case, the first case from which the infection then spread. And in the Sudan, the index case was a, were cotton factory workers. It was spread by using contaminated needles among family members. And so that was the first outbreak, 318 and 284 cases. And this occurred uh, near a river called the Ebola River in the northwest of the DRC, that red drop there. And that's why it's called Ebola hemorrhagic fever. It's caused by Ebola viruses. So the people living there did not object to their town or their river being used to name a virus. And there have been quite a few outbreaks uh, since then. So there's your first outbreak, which I've just told you. There were a few in t clustering in time around it, then a long period with no outbreaks. And then all of a sudden, in the late 90s, we had outbreaks again, mainly in Africa. And there's the big one. This is an old graph, which doesn't have the total cases. But there are over 25,000 uh, in this last outbreak. And here across Africa are where most of the outbreaks are. We now recognize four different Ebola viruses that uh, cause disease in humans. A fifth, Restin Ebola virus, not been shown to cause disease in humans. That's the topic of the hot zone, if you've read that. So four different uh, disease-causing Ebola viruses. And you can see most of them are Zaire Ebola virus uh, and fewer of the others. And the cases, again, range from a few hundred to over 25,000 in the case of the African outbreak. Now, these are what we call BSL-4 viruses, biosafety level four. And these typically cause high mortality. They're transmitted person to person, and you have no way of controlling it. And a BSL-4 lab 
uh, is a highly contained laboratory where you have to wear these space suits and they're, they're sealed so you have to have air pumped in. And so I was able to, to go into one in Boston. There, there isn't one here in New York City. It's actually outlawed to have one in New York, but in Boston they built one and it took years for it to get operative, operative because the residents, it's in the north end or the south end right by BU and the people who live there said, no, you're not bringing Ebola to our neighborhood. So it took them a long time to get over this. But it turns out it's a really safe place to work. It's a, it's a concrete cube within an outer building, so it's suspended, it's sealed, and you have to have very strict procedures for working in it. So we got the chance to tour this, and we have a video if you want to check it out. It's, it's the only documentary ever made inside a BSL-4. No one has ever done it and no one will do it again. So this is the, the kind of cool things that I like to do. We, and we have a number of BSL-4s in the US besides Boston, Atlanta, CDC. There's one in Rocky Mountain Laboratories in Hamilton, Montana, and there, and there are many others as well. So that's what you need for work on Ebola virus. And Ebola virus we've encountered briefly before. It's a filamentous envelope virus with a negative stranded RNA genome that is the template for subgenomic mRNAs, which are then translated into all the viral proteins. And notice that there are a number of antagonists encoded in this genome, a couple of interferon antagonists, a tetherin antagonist. Tetherin is the interferon-induced protein that tethers virus particles to the cell surface before, after they bud off. So this virus is antagonizing a lot of these uh, innate immune activities and one explanation for why it's so lethal, I think. How do we get infected? It's a classic zoonosis. There's typically contact with an animal carcass. Bushmeat people in these parts of the world need to get wild animals. There's no supermarket to go and buy your meat at. They have to hunt it. And so they get what they can and it's often contaminated. Although in every outbreak, we, we're not sure of the actual index case. And then that person who has contact with the animal carcass transmits it to others. That person will go home, transmit it to his or her family, and then people will get sick. The doctor will come into the home, get infected, and transmit it to other families. So you see how, how this works. It's not a very transmissible virus. The R0 is about two. So the chains of infection are short. It's very relatively straightforward to interrupt these chains of transmission especially in places where they've had it before. The problem in the West African outbreak in 2015 was the first time they'd ever seen Ebola. They waited three months before realizing it was Ebola, and by then it was really too far in to, to stop it quickly. We think that the reservoir of Ebola viruses is some kind of bat. Marburg, which is in the same family as Ebola, it's the family Filoviridae, so we have Marburg viruses, Ebola viruses, and some other viruses. Marburg virus, which has infected people, has been isolated from the fruit bat, the cave-dwelling fruit bat, Rosettus aegyptiacus, and we actually have infectious virus from those bats, so it's clear that it's replicating in them. We have found, and I say we, but I didn't do this, somebody else did it, Ebola RNA and antibodies in three tree-roosting bats, but we don't have any infectious virus, so you don't know if that's the reservoir, because it could be just fragments of RNA that got there, maybe it ate something that had the, the virus in it. So you really need to show that there's infectious virus. But we think, so we think it's the hypothesis at the moment that these are the reservoirs and that humans and gorillas and chimps are dead end hosts. We know that the virus can infect all of these. We find, of course, we know that humans are infected, uh, gorillas, it's actually wiping out gorillas in parts of Africa and chimpanzees as well. And so here's a kind of transmission diagram, if you will. So we think bats are the reservoirs that transmit it among themselves. We don't have, know how many bat species can do this. They can transmit it to other animals, including chimps and gorillas and maybe others. We don't know. We may get contact with bats directly. Some people eat bats and they may get it from that. That's part of the bush meat. And people can also get it from uh, chimpanzees as well. They hunt chimpanzees. And if they found a dead one in the forest, they, many people would eat it and it could be contaminated. So here are two outbreak examples. It was 1996 in Gabon. 37 cases of chimpanzee found dead in the forest was eaten by people hunting for food. So 18 people who were involved in butchering the animal became ill and the 10 other cases were in their family members. Another in Gabon, 
Uh, the index case was a hunter who lived in a forest camp, a dead chimp found in the forest at the time was infected with Ebola virus. So we don't actually know if that hunter contacted this chimp, but there was an infected chimp right there. So as you see, often we don't know where the infection started. So this is a, an article published near the beginning of the 2015 Ebola virus outbreak in West Africa, which was quite extensive. And we believe it began uh, in Guinea, and this is the epitracing. So when you find an infected individual, you try and trace all the individuals that that person had contact with and may have acquired the infection and passed it on. And so here, we think that the ch this child, this two-year-old child is the index case. You can see two years old, case one, fever, black stool, vomiting, uh, beginning December 2nd, died December 6th. And we don't know where that child got the infection from. This is the beginning of the African outbreak, maybe playing in the woods, maybe ate something that was contaminated, we have no idea. But that child was then cared for by the sister, the mother, the grandmother, the nurse, the village midwife. They all got sick. The midwife took care of other family and transmitted infection to them. And you can see all these interactions and it slowly spread uh, from the initial place in Guekedu to other cities as well and ended up spreading to Sierra Leone and Liberia. So this is the kind of tracing you need to do. And at the time we didn't have any vaccines available, but now we do have one. So if we could identify these chains of transmission, we could immunize everyone who has had contact uh, with a patient. The transmission, contact with infected blood or body fluids, it could be urine, saliva, sweat, feces, vomit, breast milk, semen from someone who is sick, contaminated objects like needles and syringes, but it's not transmitted by insects, water, food, or aerosol. It's not transmitted by aerosol. Now, doctor once said, if I am intubating a patient and all this water sprays back out at me, this is technically an aerosol, but it's not what we think of aerosol transmission. I could be infected by this fluid coming right out of the person's lung as I'm pumping something into it. But it's not long distance aerosol. So if there's a patient there, Breathing and infected with Ebola, I'm not going to get infected because it's not transmitted that way. Uh, it enters mucosal surfaces, breaks in your skin. You can get needle sticks, of course. And we have found virus in the skin, body fluids, nasal secretions, blood, uh, and semen. Incubation period, 2 to 21 days. You're not contagious until you have symptoms. And you start getting fever, headache, and then you're shedding virus. But before then, which can be up to 21 days, you're not contagious. And then in the peak illness, there's rash, hemorrhage, convulsion, severe metabolic disturbances, and problems in your coagulation pathways. 30 to 90% case fatality rate, which means 30, 30 to 90% of infected people, confirmed infection, will die. Not suspected, but confirmed infection. And this infection involves multiple systems, the gastrointestinal tract, the respiratory tract, the, the vascular system, and there are neurological symptoms as well. And this is not because virus is everywhere, it's in many places, but it's also causing the production of high levels of cytokines and mediators of inflammation, and these cause some of these symptoms. You have extensive necrosis in many organs, and the virus infects a lot of different cells, as you can see here. Liver enzymes are up, and there's massive lymphocyte death, but these cells are not infected, so it must be an immunological cause and make lots of inflammatory mediators, uh, and you get cytokine-mediated disease and, and impairment of your coagulation system. So it's really an amazingly broad effect, and I, I think in part that's because it's a brand new virus when it comes into human. It has not had years to adapt and moderate its pathogenesis. Now we always called Ebola virus infection an acute infection. You're infected, you have a period of disease, and it's over. But as I told you before, we have found virus in ocular fluid nine weeks after clearance of viremia. So here are some virus-induced lesions on, on the retinal scan. And we can also find it in semen. This is a study uh, done and published in the New England Journal where they looked at uh, 93 men who had recovered from Ebola virus infection. So they had confirmed infection. 49% of them had virus in semen. This is viral genome. It's not infectious virus. It's by PCR. So take it with a grain of salt. And this is a chart of months 
since the onset of the disease and the number of people that they're looking at. And we have the red Ebola RNA is detected. This is in semen again. Not detected is blue and not known is in yellow. So you can see that a number of them harbor at least genomes for long periods of time in semen. There's some suggestion that this can be transmitted this way. I'm not convinced of the evidence. There's only a few cases of that so far. So we learned a lot from this outbreak. The biggest lesson, I think, is that an outbreak somewhere else is everybody's problem. The U.S. always has this approach that you know, outbreaks in Africa or India or wherever, they're not our problem. But they are because of world travel. And in fact, in the U.S., we had four cases of Ebola stemming from this 2015 outbreak. Two imported, one into Dallas and one into New York City, and two locally acquired infections. There's one in Dallas where a nurse got infected from the patient who developed the disease after he had come, I think, from Liberia. So we have to be prepared. We have a few vaccines available. They haven't been fully tested, but we need that and we need antivirals in case these diseases are brought in. They're not likely to be transmitted extensively in the U.S. because we know how to take care of patients in, in containment to prevent spread. But, you know, the initial people who are infected, we have to be able to take care of them. And the question, of course, is what other viruses should we be preparing for? Here's another really interesting outbreak, SARS coronavirus. And he, this one I call the rise and fall of a zoonotic infection because it went away. And this is a uh, email from 2003 from this uh, MD PhD who says this morning, I received an email and found nothing related. Does anyone know about it? Have you heard of an epidemic in Guangzhou? An acquaintance of mine lives there and reports that hospitals have been closed and people are dying. So this was the first indication that something was going on. And for, for a long time, China did not tell anyone that they had an outbreak of this new respiratory disease. They hid it. And that made it spread quicker because no one else knew about it. They've since worked differently, which is good because, as I said, any outbreak is a world outbreak. So this new disease, SARS, severe acute respiratory syndrome, uh, there was an outbreak. Now we know this in retrospect. We've learned there was an outbreak uh, in this province in November 2002. 300 cases and five deaths and uh, chills, headache, malaise, myalgia, and then uh, shortness of breath. 20, 10 to 20% of these patients have very severe respiratory disease that may require mechanical ventilation. So that's where the initial outbreak took place. Unfortunately, a Chinese doctor who treated some of these first patients in Guangzhou, he went to Hong Kong and stayed on the ninth floor of this Metropole Hotel. It is now infamous because of its role in spreading SARS coronavirus. So he wasn't sick. He picked, probably got infected by one of his patients. He got sick when he arrived in Hong Kong. He died in the hospital a day later, but he spread infection to 10 other people in the hotel who then flew to different countries and spread the infection further. So he was, he was like a super spreader. Shedding a lot of virus can infect many people. And because this is an international hotel, people were there from all over the world. Eventually, it spread to 8,000 people in 29 countries and had a 10% mortality rate. I like this poster. This is a pre-SARS poster. Hong Kong will take your breath away. <laughs> Actually did, right? We intervened, not, not, not me or this country, but the world intervened. They put temperature sensors in airports. And if you had a temperature you're going through an airport in China, they would send you back to your hotel. So they limited travel of people with fevers. They did quarantine. And it turns out this virus is so poorly infectious in people, that was enough to snuff out the outbreak. Because after this, it was contained. Here's the epi curve. The outbreak ended in July uh, 2003 after uh, 1,753 cases. 8,000 cases, 774 deaths, 10% case fatality. We had, a, we had 29 here in the US, 250. Again, these are all imported cases from different places in the world. But we were able to stop the spread by preventing travel of people who were infected. Where did it come from? The current theory, and it's probably true because we've isolated similar viruses from bats in China. We looked in humans, and there's no antibodies to this virus before that first outbreak. So this is a brand new virus. It's not a reemergence of a virus. The early cases of SARS 
in this province were handlers of animals for the exotic food market. So there are lots of these open air food markets where you can buy meats. And these individuals had antibodies to the virus. And, uh, and they particularly had antibodies to this particular virus higher than control groups. And what we think happened is some of these animals that were brought in from neighboring farms had been infected on the farm by a bat that carried the virus. In particular, palm civets. This is a palm civet that people like to eat. They're grown on farms. They're infected by the bat. You bring the palm civet into the meat market, and then that spreads the infection to others. And so in these bats today, you can go there into the same area and find very similar viruses still circulating in bats that are not far away from being able to infect people. Another coronavirus emerged in 2012. So the first one, SARS coronavirus. This is MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, another respiratory disease. The first case was a 60-year-old male patient who died of pneumonia and renal failure. They got virus from that patient. They sequenced it. They identified the receptor and found it's closely related to bat coronaviruses, but it's not SARS. It's a, it's a brand new virus. And this virus is spread from camels. And it's endemic in camels in the Middle East and Africa. Although not every infection has a camel source, we're not sure where it's coming from in, in those cases. We think maybe bats were the original source of virus that infected camels many years ago. But we're not sure that we don't know in many cases how the virus is transmitted, but it's mostly very ill people who get this infection. We don't know why so few humans are infected, if it's going to spread, why it doesn't transmit well. Another One Health vaccine has been tested in camels. So we're thinking of immunizing the camels, and that would prevent spread to humans. Instead of immunizing the few at-risk humans, similar to the Hendra situation, we're going to immunize the camels, and we're making antivirals uh, for these infected patients. Now, here's the up-to-date transmission uh, and geographic range of MERS coronavirus. Most of the cases have been in the Arabian Peninsula, the red, and they have been spread to other countries by travel. Now, the yellow is the area where these camels are found to be infected with the virus. So you can see it's a broad... Uh, quite a broad area, all of northern Africa, not just the Arabian Peninsula, I India, and so forth. And so camels in all these areas are actually infected with this virus. So I don't know why we never saw it before. Uh, any case, we see, obviously, camel-to-camel -camel transmission. As soon as a camel is born, it gets virus from its parents. We see camel-to-human transmission, and sometimes human-to-human, -human, but very rare, and rare human-to-human -human as well. So the colors tell you the kinds of transmission you can see uh, there's camel to camel, where the camels are living, obviously, in the Arabian Peninsula, camel, human, human. And then the virus is brought to other countries. There have been cases where the virus is brought to Europe, uh, South Korea, been a couple of outbreaks where an index patient comes, gets sick, gets put in the hospital, and then they don't know what it is. And while that patient is in a hospital, he or she is transmitting it to other patients. So that's the human to human transmission. So here's the epi curve. Uh, up to the end of 2018. You can see some occur occasionally spikes of cases. The red is the Republic of Korea. The dark blue is Saudi Arabia. So most of them, again, are in the Arabian Peninsula. 34% case fatality rate. A lot of things we don't understand about this, but it's quite clear that camels are the most recent source. So how common are these kinds of host range jumps? Well, I think dead end jumps are very common. We don't see a lot of them. There are many cases where viruses are going from uh, animals of different sorts to human. I've told you some examples today of pigs and camels, uh, rodents, bats to humans, from ducks who spread influenza viruses. But I think they happen more often than we know, because you can't possibly know. And the ones that produce sustaining transmissions are pretty rare. And those are the ones we know about. But if you think of the list I've shown you today and on that table, they're not all that many that end up transmitting from an animal and causing the establishment of a new virus disease. But as, you know, as our population grows and we encroach on more environments globally and we do other things to encounter virus, you can predict that there's going to be more of them. And people would like to know if we can predict 
these outbreaks? And I think the answer to that is no, we can't predict them. But we can be ready. And that's what we call preparedness. We can know how to contain a lethal transmissible infection when we're caring for patients. So during the last Ebola virus outbreak, for example, we learned specific ways to take care of Ebola virus patients that we hadn't known. So certain intravenous fluids are good for keeping them healthy. We learned how to contain them and to prevent transmission. And that's why I say here in the US, we're, we're very unlikely to have transmission occur. The one case in Dallas where the nurse got infected uh, from the patient it was simply a matter of not training people well to deal with a transmissible disease like that. So we can be prepared in many ways. We can make antivirals that might broadly inhibit coronaviruses or RNA viruses in general. And so many organizations, including WHO and CDC and many others, are working to have a very high level of this. And it's not a thankful job because you're doing something that there's no reason to at the moment, but you may have a reason to do it in the future. And that kind of work has to be supported, of course. So here's the outbreak exhibit uh, in DC. It's so cool. So this is a, you know, the Smithsonian Institution. They have a whole room where they have NEPA and HENDRA and AIDS and HIV little exhibits explaining how some of the things I've told you today and it's really well done. They have nice models of viruses. I was actually fortunate to be able to go into the exhibit before hours and record an interview with the curator who, who put it together and some of the museum people who were instrumental in developing this to see how you would do such a thing. And then I just walked around the exhibit and I listened to people talking. It is really well done. And if you're ever in the DC area, this is free. It's paid for by the US government it's really worth going to. The next time we will talk about the ultimate emerging virus infection, which is HIV and AIDS.